We never stop hearing about how the internet's in the cloud, but really, it's in the ocean. About 300 undersea fiber optic cables are responsible for 99% of international data traffic. 99%, 99%, 99% of international data traffic. It's basically the same way we connect to each other in a single country, except underwater instead of underground. They transmit PewDiePie from Europe to America, and they connect stock traders in New York and London. And these cables, placed by private companies, are the backbone of the internet. But if you held one in your hand, it'd be no bigger than a soda can. There are just a few layers of protection from the water, including petroleum jelly. Yes, your internet is covered in Vaseline. They're uh, vulnerable to earthquakes. At least a few times, confused sharks have bitten them. But many cables are beneath sea life, because in some places they go as deep underwater as Mount Everest is high. Ships lower a plow that digs a tiny groove in the ocean floor, lay in the cable, and it's naturally buried by sand, thanks to the ocean's current. And that process, it's both stunningly simple and mind-blowingly complex, is responsible for making the internet a truly global network. It's an idea that's audacious and crazy, and you think it has to be cutting edge, and it is. But it's also been going on for 157 years. Electric telegraphs have been around for a long, long time. Uh, experiments in the early 1800s connected two ends of a garden using a clock that revealed letters, then they moved on to two neighborhoods to help signal trains, and then multiple cities thanks to a network of railroad lines. Underwater submarine cables were an obvious next step, so they played around. Instead of petroleum jelly, the first ones were coated with exotic tree sap to protect them from the water. And though the undersea cables came in spurts, one of the first ones was knocked out of commission by a fishing boat. Uh, by 1858, they reached around the Atlantic and across the world. And that's how it's kind of gone since. And that's how it's kind of gone since, laying cables that circle the Earth's oceans. Uh, the cables are unwound from the back of a ship, sink to the ocean floor, and the world is connected in speeds measured in milliseconds. There are ideas to bring the internet above sea level. Along with cell phone towers, there's internet beamed from Facebook satellites to Africa and balloons lifted by Google. But for speedy international travel, undersea cables are still where companies like Facebook and Google place their bets. That's because the best way to create the cloud is still by going under the sea. All telephone and data is transferred over submarine cables. Not satellite. Not satellite. Not satellite. Not satellite. Not satellite. Not satellite. And that's how it's kind of gone since. Not satellite. Now let's read about the Communications Satellite Act of 1962. It was a very controversial um, act and was left very open-ended. The act was signed August 31st, 1962 by Kennedy. Let's read what the disagreement with the passing of the act was. Democratic Senator Russell B. Long of Louisiana said of the act, When this bill first started out, I thought it was as crooked as a dog's hind leg. I am now convinced that would be a compliment. This bill is as crooked as a barrel of snakes. The American Telephone and Telegraph Company argued that using space for communications was just a modern representation of the submarine communications cables currently in use. AT&T proposed joint ownership of all the communication satellites with control based on these system facilities. Now, basically what this is saying is all these groups got together and said, let's all cheat people. Let's all screw people. You don't just get to screw them. We're all going to screw them. When we talk about the compromise that was taken in order for the legislation to pass, we see that the United States government, including the president, NASA, and the FCC were all to maintain certain duties to monitor the communication satellites. The president was to observe every aspect of the development and operation of the satellite systems. He is also responsible for providing arrangements with foreign participation. NASA was designated as a technical advisor for the FCC and the Communications Corporation to the extent that would aid the nation. NASA was to receive reimbursement for the services it rendered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's give NASA more money. A little lower, we see comments on the act after passing. This is very important. The year after the act passed, President Lyndon B. Johnson reported to Congress that the act is progressing well in light of the complexities of the problem. Yet at this point, little had actually been accomplished. There had been no communication satellites launched, and only some research had been conducted to provide moving 
a path for moving forward. Mm hmm. This was the only way a ship in distress could communicate before Marconi came on the scene in the late 19th century. Deep silence reigned on the airwaves. The only way to summon urgent assistance was by cable. But the cable was on the seabed, physically connected to the telegraph exchanges. Messages were transmitted by Morse code. In Morse, each letter is represented by a combination of dots and dashes, long and short electrical impulses. But within a few years, cable had a serious rival. The ancient university city of Bologna in Italy likes to boast of her highly charged atmosphere, just the place for inventors like Marconi, her most famous son. Even today, radio operators are known in Italy as Marconisti. From an early age, Marconi was fascinated by electricity. Working with leading researchers, he carefully built up the knowledge he needed for his inventions. He could never have done this with a conventional college education. His Irish mother brought her children up to speak English as well as Italian, and they were a musical family too. Giulielmo played the piano. While on holiday at the age of 20, he read an article on the experiments carried out by the German physicist Heinrich Hertz. This gave him a clear goal to aim at the transmission of messages by means of electromagnetic waves. A spark jumps across the gap between two live wires. It emits electromagnetic radiation. This causes a second spark in the receiver. The radiation spreads out in all directions, like light waves. This phenomenon was at the heart of Hertz's research. At the same time, Alexander Popov in Russia was performing experiments on atmospheric electricity. He developed the rod antenna for use in his thunderstorm warning device. In France, Edouard Branly invented the coherer, a more efficient form of receiver. It consists of iron filings in a tube. They cohere when a signal is received, thus closing an electrical circuit. Marconi installed a tapper in this device to shake the filings apart again preparing them for the next signal. With his goal now clear, Marconi worked like a man possessed at the top of his parents' villa. His father thought it all a lot of nonsense, a waste of time, but his mother believed in him and even brought his meals to the laboratory. After two years, he managed to get an electric bell to ring from a distance of nine meters and using a metal sheet antenna succeeded in transmitting Morse code signals. The proud result? His signals went through forests, walls, fog, night and over mountains and across seas. The electric current causes the electrons in the antenna to vibrate. They generate the radio wave. But in Marconi's early days, no one knew about electrons. Italy showed little interest in the invention, so Marconi went to Britain. With its enormous navy, Britain might be able to make good use of wireless transmission, he thought. The post office engineers, though sceptical, gave him support. Using antennas suspended from flying kites, Marconi soon achieved a range of 15 kilometers over water and sent the first wireless telegrams. The king of Italy suddenly woke up and sent for the 24-year-old king of the airwaves. A number of Italian warships were equipped with his apparatus. The frequency spectrum was still very broad, but it was adequate for summoning assistance, for example. Word spread that ships with Marconi equipment were safer. The most urgent problem was to find a way of filtering the actual message out of a jumble of waves. Steady improvements in the receivers, allowing accurate tuning, enabled transmitters and receivers to function more reliably. Alongside the equipment, Marconi also hired out the radio operator, an entirely new trade. He imposed one condition. Messages could only be sent to his stations, an effective monopoly. 
Altogether, Marconi held 800 wireless telegraphy patents. Radio was first used in crime detection when wife murderer Dr. Crippen was arrested on a steamer on his way to America. The wireless signal had got there first. When the Titanic sank, 700 passengers owed their lives to the SOS message broadcast by the ship's radio operator. After this disaster, emergency frequencies were agreed worldwide. Cartoonists showed Marconi bartering for souls with King Neptune. Eleven years earlier, Marconi had secretly prepared his attempt to bridge the Atlantic. At Paul Du, on the coast of southwest England, he built the biggest transmitting station yet seen. It took a year to complete, but he told no one what he planned. The antennas were damaged by winter storms, but at 12.30, one December day in 1901, he reported the weak reception of signals from 3,200 kilometers across the Atlantic. Ecco giungere al mio orecchio, debolmente, i segnali che venivano lanciati nello spazio dalla stazione di Polju sull'altra sponda dell'oceano. His diary listed only the frequencies and, hardly legible, the times of reception. The sober record of a sensational feat by which he proved those scientists wrong who maintained that the radio waves would go off into space in a straight line. Conclude this point by saying that you've accepted oh, that it's based on an assumption. Is that is, do you do you still maintain that position? Well, uh, it's the standard model. Of the Sorry, world. the standard model has no scientific backing. It is an assumption, correct? Well, it's the standard model. Sorry, the, the standard model has no scientific evidence. You only assume a value of R, correct, Mick? For crying out loud, man. Yeah. Right. Correct, Mick, for crying out loud, man. Yeah. Right. And so Marconi's vision of a worldwide radio network has come true. It's been called the quiet workhorse of space science, a means of transporting ambitious and hefty scientific experiments to the edge of space. Start inflation at this time. Everybody got earplugs and wants them. While the technology may seem old fashioned, it remains the quickest and most cost efficient avenue to near space. When you compare to satellite missions that take five to seven years to develop and millions of dollars, the scientific ballooning can be done on a fraction of that budget and in a fraction of that time. From the study of the atmosphere to the origins of the universe, it's been the vehicle for some of the most significant scientific discoveries of our time. And the future holds even more promise for one of the greatest scientific stories never told. They can fly that 8,000 pound payload, the weight of three small cars, nearly 23 miles high to an invisible ceiling where the atmosphere ends and space begins and can stay there riding upper atmospheric winds for up to six weeks. Due to the natural difference in density between the helium gas used to fill the balloons and the air, as these zero pressure balloons ascend in the atmosphere, they expand to volumes of up to 40 million cubic feet, nearly the size of a stadium like the Louisiana Superdome. But to launch those into space would take a very expensive launch vehicle. I mean, really literally only $100 million for the launch. And whether we do these for, you know, well, certainly one hundredth of that or less and we can have uh, greater access to space, uh, more frequent flights of science, and in the end, the scientist gets their payload back. From New Mexico 
to Arctic Sweden and Australia to the coldest and driest continent, Antarctica. The Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility launches 15 to 20 balloons a year over four to five campaigns. All right, guys, we're ready. Locations are typically dictated by science or longer data gathering air time. Any science that can be done above about 99.5% of the Earth's atmosphere, either looking up or looking down, uh, can be done on balloons. The scientists using scientific balloons include some of the world's most seasoned researchers and university professors, even graduate students. The young scientists can design the experiment, build the experiment, fly the experiment, and analyze the data, go through all aspects of a space mission, which is not possible with our large space program, large space mission. And ballooning is a vehicle for world-class science. In the mid-1980s, an ozone hole was discovered over the Antarctic continent. The initial measurements were all made from scientific balloons. So when you're at the FTP site, click here for the site description. So when you do, a text file comes up and you can see right here, they tell you that all of the images in the archive use the underlying colored land images from the NASA Blue Marble data set. Yep. So the Himawari is actually completely, totally debunked right there. These aren't real pictures coming from a satellite in a geostationary orbit above the Earth getting snapped every 10 minutes and being beamed down for us to all ooh and ah over. They take the Blue Marble data, uh, data set, which I'm sure you remember, they admitted years ago was a flat strip data pieced together uh, by an artist named Rob Simon in Photoshop because it had to be, <laughs> right? But to move on and then to just briefly show you how they generate a picture every 10 minutes with what appears to be accurate and current weather, this is basically what they do. Now, don't take my word for it, as I always say, go check it out for yourself. Number one, they have already created and stored transparent images of the weather over the oceans using climate simulation software, which they openly admit right here that they've done climate simulations up to the year 2095. But it's actually the year 2100 on this FTP server folder, and here's one of the images. And following some of the other images uh, that you can find where the land masses are transparent, and they use all this simulation software to come up with the weather over the oceans. You know, since our weather data comes from our ground-based Doppler radar, and it's impossible to use ground-based systems to cover the entire vast oceans, so that's where the weather over the oceans comes from, their software simulations. Number two. Now, for the weather over the land, the NOAA has supercomputers that take data coming in from all over the world, Doppler radar feeds, and crunch it all together and combine it with the weather simulation data over the oceans. So they come up with a complete composite <laughs> uh, weather, quote-unquote, map, which is then wrapped around a ball in their 3D modeling software programs, just like we've shown countless times in our previous episodes with the Earth and the planets, etc. So... Then what we get are composite images like this that are created in the 3D modeling software. The current Doppler weather uh, data over land and the simulated weather over the oceans and it looks like this. So this particular image is on the FTP server and is date and time stamped with October 11th, 2017 at 11.05 a.m. I just chose one randomly. Notice the image shows you the weather for the whole ball and not just part of the ball that is lit by the sun at this particular time. No terminator line or anything like that, right? Okay, now here's the kicker. Go to the other file folder, which is the images that we get to see and are told are real pictures from space. But what they've simply done is taken the weather map picture of the whole ball they created and they superimpose it over the blue marble data set, just like they said they did. So what you can see here is the final version of what we're spoon-fed and told is a picture taken by the Himawari from space like, you know, 10 minutes ago. This is the image from the same date and time, October 11th, 2017 at 11.05 a.m. And you can see that the weather is exactly the same. Watch it closely. There's your weather map comprised of simulated and Doppler radar being used to complete a composite image. They do this with the Discover satellite too, the epic camera from a million miles away, they tell us. Ridiculous. Okay. Now, also notice the uh, final image has a Terminator line added in to try to make it look like a real picture from space, which drives a nail in the coffin of the Himomori because the weather data shows it over the whole ball completely. But they have to add a Terminator line to show the Earth only par partially lit. Uh, by the sun based on the time of day that the photo is allegedly taken. So if this is a real picture, how did they know where to put the clouds and weather on the part of the globe with no sunlight? It's completely dark there. 
It's all right here, guys. They are faking space. Hey, we all fell for it for a long time with their Doppler radar and weather simulation software building a current weather picture and wrapping it around a ball in 3D software and pasting it onto a black background like they do with all the others, adding a Terminator line and calling it a real picture from space. Himawari debunked. Another high-profile balloon-borne experiment called Boomerang in 1998 showed the geometry of the universe is basically flat. Showed the geometry of the universe is basically flat. In the end, the payload is recovered and returned to the science team to fly another day. Scientific ballooning, the best kept secret in space science. We're not blasting into the air with, beating the air to death with propellers or, or screaming through the air with rocket engines or jet engines. Nothing could be more elegant or simple. It's a continuity. I, I don't think lighter than air travel will ever be obsolete just because it is so perfectly elegant in its application. I, I don't think lighter than air travel will ever be obsolete. I, I don't think lighter than air travel will ever be obsolete. This is the list of all balloon launches from the Isranj Space Center in Sweden. You see this people? What does that say? Mir. That's the Mir space module. February 24th, 1997. Here goes another one. Mir. March 17th, 1997. Mir. Okay? I want you to see these things. Here we go. Two more. Mir. February 18th, February 19th, 1999. Mir. It's a Mir space module, people. On a balloon. The ISS does not exist complete the way they show it on television. Here goes another one. Mir on a balloon. What they are showing you of the space station is a computer generated image. They are not showing you a complete module put together flying at 17,000 miles an hour. Here you go. Look at this. Support Mir. They sent up a support balloon to sub resupply the Mir on a balloon. On a balloon, people. Look at this. Orion. Orion payload. Look at here. In Marsat. You want to know where your satellite uh, phone communications come from? A balloon, people. A balloon. I'll supply this document to whoever wants it. Here we go. In Marsat test. Balloon. If you were to take time to search every single one of these flights to match it up, with a particular rocket launch that they claim this thing was on, I guarantee you, you will be able to compare it with this Swedish Isran Space Center balloon flight list. Balloon flight list. Balloons, people. That's your program. It's always been your program. Look at this. Mere short duration. Mere VLD. You got two VLD. Look at here. More mere. This is in 2002, people. 2002. Every, for those in Europe, you ever heard of Enviasat? Look at Enviasat. Enviasat. These things are supposed to be testing the atmosphere for particulates and, you know, for pollution control. Balloons, people. You, you, you just, you can't come to any other conclusion. You don't have any other information to prove you were at the launch pad and you saw them put this thing inside the nose cone of a rocket. You didn't see it. You work for NASA, you work for the Germans, you work for the Russians. You did not see what you thought you saw going into a nose cone of a capsule and with, with, a, with an unedited video stream and put on a launch pad and launched into the sky on a rocket. You didn't see that. Look at NASA. Why is NASA using, why is NASA using the Swedish to launch a balloon for them? Think about that. They're everywhere, people. 
They're carrying out the deception, the fraud, the hoax, the scam, the bullshit. It's all here. It's all here, people. I keep saying it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Cloaked in secrecy, two American spy planes, the U-2 and the SR-71 Blackbird, made their mark on history during the Cold War. The U-2 was the first to become operational in 1956. Built originally for the CIA by the Lockheed Advanced Development Projects Group, better known as the Skunk Works, the U-2 could fly higher than any aircraft in existence at the time and provided crucial intelligence on Soviet military activities. When there was worry that the Soviet Union might be gathering a bomber fleet or might be gathering its forces for an attack on Western Europe or whatever else it might be up to, there was no way literally to penetrate this Iron Curtain. The U-2 operations really gave rise to some remarkable images. There was imagery brought back that showed Soviet fighters trying to climb and catch it, stalling, spinning out of control, falling to Earth, other airplanes trying to do so-called pop-ups to get to altitude. Clearly, they knew we were there, but they were very frustrated at not being able to reach us with airplanes. The long, wide, straight wings of the U-2 gave the plane glider-like characteristics and it would soar so far above the ground that even if the Soviet military detected it, they couldn't reach it with fighters or missiles. Or so it was believed until May 1st, 1960. On that day, Francis Gary Powers was shot down by Soviet missiles as he took photos from 67,000 feet. After Powers successfully ejected, the Soviets put him on trial for espionage. The incident severely strained US-Soviet relations. Powers was released two years later. Today, high altitude reconnaissance is done mainly by satellites. Today, high altitude reconnaissance is done mainly by satellites. But an updated version of the U 2 has provided battlefield intelligence in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. It is also being used for high-altitude research projects by NASA and other civilian agencies. We do Earth sciences. NASA has done it for 30 years or more. And that requires overflight over forest fires, over forests, desert, um, into the Arctic to check on the, uh, the ozone layer, which NASA first discovered. We fly a bigger variant of the U-2. But we have two of them, and we fly them worldwide on various missions of those kinds. As effective and enduring as the U-2 has been, it wasn't enough to meet America's reconnaissance needs at the height of the Cold War. Once again, the Lockheed Skunk Works, headed by the legendary Kelly Johnson, was tapped to come up with something better. And in 1962, they outdid themselves. SR-71 Blackbird, a high-speed, high-altitude spy plane, is revered by many as one of the greatest jet planes ever built. The ethereal Blackbird could fly higher and faster than any jet aircraft in production, and that still holds today. I knew that this airplane was going to be the fastest in the world. What I didn't know was it would remain the fastest for 40 years. That's astonishing. But I remember back in the 60s, Kelly used to say, and he'd say it kind of aggressively, like I challenge anyone to adversely comment on this. He says, nobody's going to produce an airplane with greater performance than this one by the year 2000. And back then I used to think, well, I hope I hang around long enough for the year 2000 to see if that turns out to be accurate, because before this came along, every two or three years, somebody somewhere would produce one faster. And basically, by the time you saw the thing on radar going at Mach 3, it was gone. But now the Blackbird really is gone. The military mothballed the SR-71 fleet in 1990, claiming satellites could do the job better. Claiming, 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 claiming satellites could do the job better. Claiming. The goal of Project Loon is to bring internet to the almost two out of three people on the world who don't have internet access today. And we're doing that using high altitude balloons. Three, two, one. 
The very first tests we did showed that it could work. So we began to think, wow, we're going to need to have a manufacturing system that can manufacture many, many of these balloons. We're going to need to have a mission control system that can keep track of the balloons. We're going to need to have an operations team that can launch these balloons and then recover them when they're ready to come down. So each piece of the process got to be bigger. We had to scale up. It was pretty challenging, getting the balloons to be more durable and more long-lasting. For a while, many of them leaked for some reason or another, and they would come down over the course of a few hours or a few days. It was like a detective job to figure out what was introducing tiny leaks. Now our balloons last over 100 days. At first, it would take us three or four days to tape together a balloon. Today, through our own manufacturing facility, the automated systems can get a balloon produced in just a few hours. We're getting close to the point where we can roll out thousands of balloons. Thousands of balloons. In the beginning, it was all we could do to launch one balloon a day. Now, with our automated crane system, we can launch dozens of balloons a day for every crane we have. To steer one balloon, left or right, you actually go up or down. And that's because in the stratosphere, the wind goes slightly different direction at a different altitude. To provide continuous internet service, you're talking a, a complex choreography where thousands of balloons are being steered and programmed all in an automated fashion. So another balloon is coming just at the right time to take it place of the one that left. Our mission control system allows us to track every balloon and lets us optimally position the balloons to provide coverage exactly where the people needing internet coverage are. We can track the location and projected trajectory of every balloon from the moment we launch it, on the way up till it reaches altitude, from the time we decide it's ready to bring it down, all the way down the descent to a spot on the ground. With our system, we use LTE, which is a common protocol that most of the telcos around the world use. So anyone with a smartphone anywhere in the world will be able to get internet access. One of the key things we do is we partner with the local telco in every country. In New Zealand, we're partnering with Vodafone. We like to think of ourselves as being very innovative in Vodafone New Zealand, so we thought this was a great partnership. Project Loon allows cell phone companies and internet providers to provide an internet to communities that don't have it. Ultimately, the goal of any internet service provider is to have 100% geographic coverage and all the capacity and speed that people expect. Project Loon will help deliver that. If you look at the system today, it's amazing how much more advanced it is from being 10 times higher data rate to the balloons lasting over 10 times as long to the steerability of the balloons to the steerability of the balloons. We've flown in the tropics, we've flown in the Arctic regions. The technology is working. We're getting close to the point where we can bring the internet to people around the world. And people will swear this is satellite internet. Mm-hmm, sure it is. Now, I'm going to do a little bit more reading, and this all comes from globalcomssatphone.com. You'd think that satellite phones would make sense and would be easy to use, but let's read a couple of their terms and conditions. First one, talking about data transmission use and dropped calls. And due to the technical nature of data setups and the inherent sophistication of data transmission through a variety of operating systems, Globalcom makes no representation as to the success of data calls through our system, along with the potential incorrect use. The Iridium system is a low Earth orbiting satellite constellation, has inherent flaws and anomalies that can create dropped calls of either voice or data nature. Globalcom can provide data setup technical support beyond the normal provided setup instructions at an additional charge. Now let's read about their limitation of liability, you know, in case you find out that satellites don't exist. Among other things, it says the satellite services provided by the provider may be temporarily interrupted, delayed, or otherwise limited, and is not available everywhere in the world. Imagine that. Uh, Globalcom shall have no liability or credit due for interrupted service unless caused by our gross negligence. 
They shall not be uh, liable for acts or omissions or uh, from other carriers, equipment failures or modifications, acts of God, strikes, government actions, or causes beyond their reasonable control. Globalcom makes no warranties with respect to the service of any kind whatsoever, expressed or implied, except as specifically provided in this agreement. So then I was thinking, at least they get great internet service, right? So I looked that up and it says, well, I have access to the internet. Yes, of course you'll have access to the internet. And it says, what is the rate of the data speed? Very slow, 2,500 baud, slower than dial up. Go satellite phones. This is where I think every one of these guys needs to go. All these liars and scammers. You'll see here in the Dish Network Agreement that you are required to return all such leased equipment in good operating condition uh, within 30 days of disconnection of your service. You are not required, however, to return the Dish Antenna, which shall become your property upon complete service cancellation. Hmm, I wonder why they don't want their satellite dish back. Let's say you've got a 747, a perfectly good, if slightly aging, wide-body jet. This 747 is 40 years old. NASA has owned it for 20 of those years. And if you can make out at the back there behind the wing, sometime in that period, they decided it would be a really good idea to cut a 16 by 23 foot hole into the plane. It's not just any old hole in the fuselage, it's for this. This is SOFIA, which stands for Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. It's a massive flying telescope operated by NASA and the German space agency DLR. You might think that this is insanity uh, or crazy idea, and there was a time, especially as we were developing it, because we ran into so many problems, the door had to work just right, and it took years to get that door to be right. But once we got it working, we were getting results that can't be done any other way at this point. We were getting results that can't be done any other way at this point. We were getting results that can't be done any other way at this point. Can't be done any other way at this point. Sophia has a lot in common with the Hubble Space Telescope. They're similar sizes. But where Hubble concentrates on visible and ultraviolet light, which scientists use to make incredible full-color images, SOFIA looks primarily at infrared light, which means it can be used to study things like the clouds of gas that will give birth to new stars. To get the best observations, the plane flies into the stratosphere and then opens its massive door so that the telescope can peer into space. We climbed on board to have a look around with Eric Becklin, Sophia's chief scientist. So we're inside a 747 and you don't really, when you get on as a passenger, you don't appreciate the full height of the plane and you're making full use of the, the it, full cylinder it, here. It, yeah, no, it is, it is huge. There are only 30 telescopes that are larger than Sophia, but we're flying in an aircraft. It's versatile too. New equipment can be fitted to make different kinds of observations. Different kinds of observations. The telescope is a marvel of engineering with gyroscopes and precision bearings, keeping it locked on its target, even through turbulence. The thing I like about SOFIA is that uh, it brings together uh, astronomy, which I love and I do, and it brings together airplanes. Everybody is excited about airplanes, but doing them together is really uh, very special. Hello, my name is Jack Schlant. In this quick two minute video, I'm going to give an overview of electrodynamic tethers. I'm going to start with what is an electrodynamic tether, talk about the basics and the general mechanics of these devices, and then I'm going to briefly touch on some of the many applications of electrodynamic tethers. Okay, so electrodynamic tethers are a type of space tether that takes advantage of a planet's magnetic field to generate a current and drive some resistive load. In the diagram, we can see a simple model of an EDT. The tether itself is just a very long conducting wire, usually on the order of several kilometers in length and it's attached to some sort of space vessel, usually a satellite. And the basic principle is that electrons are collected from the upper atmosphere of Earth, in this case, onto the bare conducting tether, and then forced down through the wire by the virtue of the direction of Earth's magnetic field. 
and they travel down through the wire and eventually get expelled as free electrons again at the emitter. Thus, we have an electric potential generated across the tether, which can be as large as hundreds or thousands of kilowatts for sophisticated designs, and produced at a pretty low cost. Electrodynamic tethers can be used for many different applications. Broadly, EDTs can operate as electrical generators, converting kinetic energy to electrical energy, or motors, converting electrical energy to kinetic energy. Because of this, one main application of EDTs is in something called tether propulsion systems, which have the ability to change the orbit of a spacecraft. Tether propulsion systems are seen as a cheaper alternative to conventional rocket thrusters, active once the payload being transported into space has reached low Earth orbit. EDTs of this kind can break or accelerate the satellite they're attached to by applying a direct current to the tether. This and many other applications of EDTs were designed using knowledge of the Lorentz force, which governs the total ENMF exerted on a charged particle moving through an electric field and magnetic field, and is in the direction of the cross product of the E field and the B field. EDTs have a long list of both current and potential future applications. We touched on the first three in this list, power generation, electrodynamic thrusters, and altitude stabilization. It also can be used in the fields of radiation shielding, communication antennae, low gravity laboratory simulations, and space transfer vehicle launch. In the scope of scientific knowledge, EDTs and space tethers in general are a relatively new field of research. Though EDTs have been successfully demonstrated in several space missions, notably the TSS-1, TSS-1R, and plasma motor generator missions, TSS just stands for Tethered Space Station, there is much about e EDTs that remains to be optimized and implemented to full potential. Well, that's pretty neat. I mean, NASA uses electromagnets and this track to help them develop new ways to propel a spacecraft into orbit. And you know what? NASA's also using electricity, magnetism, and tethers to help them propel spacecraft already in orbit. Wait, you said tethers, like tether ball with the pole and the rope attached to the ball? Absolutely. Some other examples of tethers besides tether ball are the elastic string that keeps a paddle ball on a paddle, a fishing line that keeps the fish on a pole, and even a leash that keeps a dog close to its owner. Maybe you can think of some more examples. NASA's latest space adventure has gone horribly wrong in Central Australia. A giant helium balloon and its state-of-the-art cargo has crashed on takeoff, smashing into cars and sending onlookers running for their lives. Anna Henderson reports. As the giant helium balloon was launched into the air, its precious cargo became a high-speed projectile. Unexpected strong winds pushed the two-ton platform of scientific instruments off course and onto a path of destruction. Maybe you can think of some more examples. You know, NASA has been using tethers and conducting experiments in space for years. You're right. In fact, in the 1960s, the Gemini astronauts used tethers to connect their spacecraft to another unoccupied rocket. The 1960s! Far out, man. What? Over the years, NASA has learned that connecting two spacecraft together opens up a whole new world of possibilities, like propelling a spacecraft. One person who knows all about tethers in space is physicist Les Johnson, and he works at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Thanks, Van. We're testing a new kind of propulsion system for space that doesn't need any rocket engines or fuel. Instead, it'll use the Earth's magnetic field to help push or pull on the spacecraft. All magnetic objects form invisible lines of force that extend between the poles of the object. A magnetic field is the space around the magnet where you feel its force. Magnetic field lines extend and radiate between the Earth's north and south poles and between the poles of the magnet. Basically, the Earth's magnetic field works with a special type of wire or conductor called an electrodynamic tether to push or pull on the object. The electrons that make up the electric current flowing through the conductor will experience a force when they move through a magnetic field like the Earth's. Since they're trapped in the conducting wire tether, the force will be applied to the tether and whatever is attached to it. Depending upon the direction in which the current is flowing, this force can be a push or a pull, either lowering or raising a spacecraft's orbit.
So the direction of the current determines whether it's pushing or pulling. And the more current, the more force. Right. In fact, NASA Marshall is working on a project called ProSeds, which uses the Earth's magnetic field to push or pull on the attached tether. When the tether moves, so does the spacecraft. Les, ProSeds is an acronym, right? What does it stand for? ProSeds stands for Propulsive Small Expendable Deployer System. Space exploration is limited largely by the cost of launching payloads. Finding a cheaper way to explore space is always very important to us. Typically, a rocket will place its payload into low Earth orbit, and from there, propellant fuel thrusters have to boost it to a higher altitude. ProSeds is one experiment that focuses on the technology to cut the expense of placing a payload into its final orbit. Sounds like ProSeds can be a nice alternative to using rocket engines and lots of fuel. Absolutely. Scientific ballooning the best kept secret in space science. Absolutely. Electrodynamic tethers could one day be used as a cheap, lightweight, and reliable way to remove space junk from orbit, keep the International Space Station in orbit, and even power missions at other planets. Wow, this can get us to other planets? Tethers offer us unlimited possibilities, Van. That's why I'm all charged up about this project. Thank you for calling NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, located on Greenbelt Road in Greenbelt, Maryland, 20771. Please select one of the following. For directions to the center, press 1. For departmental directory, press 2. For NASA employee directory, press 3. For Spell the last and first name, then press pound. For Q, press 7. For Z, press 9. For help, press 0. So they're asking me to spell the last name. Let's spell... For... Mike. At extension 6, 1, 4, 3, 7, press pound. To cancel, press stop. This is Mike. Mike, uh, Miss Miss Linsky. Yeah. Mr. Miss Linsky, sorry about that. This is uh, Robert Bassano. How are you? I'm a graduate student. I wanted okay. to I wanted to know if um there was just a couple of questions you could um help me out with with some answers. I'm on you guys' website right now, and um it's regarding Hubble. Okay. Okay. Where are you at? I'm 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 a graduate student at a university. Okay. What? I'm working. I'm working on a MATLAB image processing toolbox application that processes um, a variety of images to determine the relation with other images that might have been manipulated or or amended or maybe it was to determine the original source. So I'm for a project that I'm involved in. I'm actually using some of the images from Hubble and Sophia to conduct comparative analysis. That's it. So I have some questions regarding uh, HST that um, um, would help me out with kind of understanding a little bit more about um, some of the photos that are and images that are available on you guys' website that I'm looking at right now. Okay. Well, I, I, I have to refer you to our Science Institute for talking about the, the um, science images. Well, no, I, I don't. I don't need to talk about the science images per se. Okay. I'm. I'm wanting to know if there are any available video images or any other assets in GeoSync that actually conduct sort of an inspection, a video or photographic inspection of HST. As it goes around in geosync, because I'm I'm looking at all the videos you guys have on online on NASA's website, and all the videos that I've seen, they're all CGI and computer generated, you know, um, uh, illustrations and other type of computer generated images that that are not original source coming straight from Hubble or any other asset vehicle that may be within range of Hubble to take photographs of it. 
think okay, that, 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 that 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 are you able to okay. view Hubble in real time? To view Hubble in real time? No. Yeah. Are you able? Are you able to obtain and view a real time image of Hubble as it is right now, wherever it is? No, we, we can't do that. Or is there any other vehicle that can view Hubble in operation? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Can, can I ask you how long you've been working on the team at the with the HST, HST team? I've been with HST over uh, 25 years. Now, have there been any real-time video, high-definition video images of Hubble at 330 miles or so? Not that I'm aware of. There are none? Not that I'm aware of. Wow. Yeah, so S&T wouldn't be able to tell me anything. I mean, yeah, you're, the, I'm, you're, I'm you're the DMO. You're the... You're the, you're the DMOM, and you're saying in 25 years you've never seen Hubble actually in real time. Well, we certainly had servicing missions. Well, yeah, you've had servicing missions, but you're not able to see what's going on with Hubble from the ground in real time. We, we do not have optical tracking of Hubble from the ground. That's true. Okay, so so... So you don't have optical tracking of Hubble from the ground? No, we don't. Wow. So so if I if let's just say if I use my Celestron, there's no way for me to actually get a visual, real time visual of Hubble as it say was passing over Virginia. You might be able to you know, track the the um sunlight the lens off of it. Well wait, wait, wait. wait. I, I'll be able to track what? Sunlight reflecting off of it. But operationally, we do not we do not look at the vehicle, you know, from the ground. These radio signals that transmit engineering data from the vehicle to us, but we do not look at it physically. Okay, when they when when STS missions or any other mission goes up to service Hubble, well, I mean, sir, mm -hmm. the last time Hubble was serviced was the last shuttle mission, right? Well, not the last shuttle mission, but, you know, we were last serviced in um, 2008. Now, so, so the last servicing mission was in 2008, and from, from the research I did, I think they put up the, the, the WFPC-3 camera, right? That was the last camera installed. Right. Okay. So when they service, what, what altitude... Is Hubble at when STS goes up to service it? I mean, does it drop down to uh, an altitude where STS, you know, can get within range of it, or does STS go up to that altitude? The space shuttle goes up to that altitude. I'm just trying to wrap this and wrap my head around this because ISS is somewhere around 230, 240. Hubble's supposed to be almost a hundred miles above. ISS, but That's I've true. never, yes. I've never seen any video from servicing where any STS mission has gone that far out above ISS. I mean, I know we have geosync out there, you know, way above that, but I've never seen that. I'm that's what I'm trying to look for. I'm trying to find video in NASA's archive where they actually show the mission with them approaching and doing the orbits to you know gain altitude to get to Hubble. Or is there any there's no other video available of that? They would actually show it from outside the of, of um the space shuttle you're talking about? Something watching the space shuttle? Yeah, just showing on? showing STS actually getting ready to approach Hubble to capture it so it can be serviced. No, I, I, I know no one's no video showing that. You know. Um, I'm I'm still trying to figure out the math on 
how much fuel was there more than 93 or 95 percent fuel required to get the 25,000 pound telescope up in geosync? Are you talking about the fuel on, on the space shuttle? Yeah, I mean, when when the, when when HST yeah, launched, yeah. they actually took us to the highest altitude possible that they could achieve. Um, and what was that? With the space shuttle. Pardon? What was that? What was that altitude? Oh, I'd have to look that up. I don't know that number offhand. Because it, because it, I I looked at about a dozen, um, tele, a dozen videos with telemetry data, and I always see STS separate from the main fuel tank at around 340, 350,000 feet, and then it continues on, gain, you know, accelerating and gaining velocity, so it could get at at terminal velocity of around 17,000. But then from there, I've never seen any other footage um, where STS is is gone higher than ISS. Uh, it, it's certainly, you know, like you said, we're, we're about 100 miles above ISS. Yeah, it's about 100. Yeah, well, um, now, yeah. let, let me, the, the one critical question I want to ask is this. Are you familiar with the Federation Aeronautic International Database, the FAI.org? No, I'm not. Okay. No, I'm not. Well, I'm... I, I am, and NASA is actually a member of FAI. Every single, well, not I wouldn't say every single STS mission, but I'd say about two thirds of the STS missions, specifically the servicing missions for HST, are mm -hmm. in this database. It's FAI.org, Federation Aeronautic Internationale. When I put in the data for for STS thirty one. On April 24th, 1990, nothing comes up. So I put in, I decided to use some other uh, uh, search query factors. I put in the crew members' names. Um, nothing comes up. I put in the STS mission number. Nothing comes up. So then I decided, okay, this falls under another category. And they have a list of category that describe, you know, one or more astronauts traveling to a celestial body, one or more astronauts, the amount of time they spent in space, so on and so forth, you know, um, durations. So I decided to click on the, the, the selection that says greatest mass lifted to greatest altitude. Okay. So I would, I just, I automatically and logically assumed that you know STS was one of the greatest mass if not the greatest mass lifted to greatest altitude of 330 miles and there's nothing in the database so over a period of four months I kept checking the database and FAI actually update they they shut down the website and then updated their database um, and, and I'm not sure if this was direct, but I had sent them an email saying, you know, I'm looking for this particular mission on this particular date. Here goes the data. Um, is there a possibility that you have a problem updating your database? Could you please let me know or correct this? So a few days later, the website went down and it came back up. So I, I went searching for the data again. Now, I'm making a weekly habit of doing this checking 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 because maybe it's just some sort of database entry error that that's common in just about every single local national international database with 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 that type of um error that may occur where maybe i'm not using the, the right search criteria so i sent fai.org an email asking them could you please let me know if i'm not looking at this the right way could you locate this information in your database they sent me back an email telling me no this is not this was not registered in our database no one filed an application for this to be put into the record book so the conclusion i'm coming to is this is there is there a reason why nasa didn't put hst hst in in the record books but they put every servicing mission in the record books because every servicing mission is listed but hst STS-31 on April 24, 1990 is not listed. I, I can't speak to that, but, you know, obviously that's not a NASA uh, database. No, no, I, and I, and I, and I, yeah, I do. I, I'm completely, I understand that. But, again, I know it's not a database that NASA 
maintain the database at all. Mm. So I, I, please forgive me for saying this. Just please forgive me. I, and I don't want it to sound like some sort of crackpot idea or weird conspiracy because that's not where I'm going with this. I have to say that I'm questioning that Hubble is even where they say it is. Because why wouldn't a one and a half billion dollar telescope, which is being used by every university around the world and every scientist who's involved in any kind of astrophysics, astrodynamics, just space exploration period, if we're getting these images from Hubble and SOFIA, which is a 747 special purpose, with the same exact technical specifications when it comes to the telescope, Sophia's is taking the same exact pictures of Hubble. And that's where the that's where the disparity in image analysis comes in, because I have a half a dozen photos I took off from NASA's website for Hubble and Sophia. And when I ran them through Math Lab's image processing toolbox for comparative analysis, that those images came from the same source. And it wasn't at it wasn't at 330 miles above the surface of the Earth. So that's oh, that's where I'm I'm trying to understand. You know, I'm I'm mostly into IT, sir. That's what I do. I'm into information technology, security engineering, and database management. And I know NASA has massive, a massive, massive database. You guys got over a dozen supercomputers all around the country, all around the world that need to be managed about just about by any and everybody. And their tasks are are solely to keep the, they keep the systems up to date and make sure they're operating efficiently and effectively so that you can be able to go to your computer terminal and type up a query and that information comes up literally in a nanosecond. That's how readily available it is. So my, my, my problem right now is that it makes no sense to me and why STS-31 is not in the database. And you confirm that you've worked for them for 25 years and nobody sitting in at Goddard who's on the Hubble team has ever seen Hubble in real time conducting any operations on the ground that could have been shot from another satellite asset with a high definition camera and imaging to take a picture of Hubble. Why do you expect anybody to do that? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to explain to you why. Because I used to be in the military, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. You don't send okay. out a drone or an ROV and not have cameras on it so that you can track where it's going and where it's at and what might come in contact with it to interfere with its operations. And, I, and just to be honest with you, it, you know, paying my taxes, one and a half billion dollars, I'd want to keep an eye on that asset. Not just from signal and telemetry data, but I also, in the year, you know, in the 21st century, I need to have eyes on when I need to have eyes on, just in case something went wrong. Well, if, if something goes wrong, it, it wouldn't be something external necessarily. No, it, that's not, okay. that's not, I wouldn't say that that's so because I, I, I know of at least a few events where Hubble had to be retasked because it had to avoid collision with, with something else that was up there. Well, you're misinformed then. Well, I, I, I can't be misinformed if the data actually came from NASA. Could you share point me to where it says that, that Hubble was actually retasked because of, of some external, I'll, I'll call it a threat or external, you know, no, I mean, it just, it had to be flipped around. It had to be maneuvered to go to either, a, a go to a higher altitude or, or, or change its trajectory because there was, an, there was something up there that might have collided with another satellite from another country. Well, you're, you're, you are sadly misinformed then. Okay. Because Hubble doesn't even have a propulsion system, so it can't possibly change its orbit. By so, itself. so how does it move position? I suggest that you build up a little bit more on. No, I mean I have the data right in. Vehicle. I have the data right up in front of me. I mean it, you, it's right on your website. It, it's right here, spacecraft and instruments. I'm looking. It's right on the left hand side. 
it says what the Hubble's capabilities are, how it maneuvers, how it changes direction. That, that's just rotating the vehicle. That is not changing altitude. That is not changing trajectory. That is not changing orbit. Okay. That is just changing its orientation. So you're saying that Hubble actually stays at the same altitude through every orbit and it doesn't decay in altitude. It doesn't lose altitude. It loses altitude because of atmospheric drag. Okay, so when it loses out only. So over twenty only. years at three hundred and thirty miles, we do the mathematics, ISS loses somewhere between one and a half to two miles every five three to five minutes. So what is what is keeping over 20 years, Hubble should actually almost be within 10 miles of ISS. Well, I, I, sir, I've done the math. I don't know about you, sir, but I've done the math. At 340 miles, that's what's on your website, 15 orbits a day, Hubble should actually be nearly within 10 miles of ISS if ISS is actually at somewhere around 220 245 miles. That's that's the stated standard data. I've actually seen data on NASA's website. It's clear as day. I can send you the information where actually ISS has gone from 245 miles to 190 miles above the surface of the Earth. And then it jumped. And then they fired whatever thrusters or whatever to put it back up into its normal geosync orbit at low Earth or in low Earth or, uh, altitude. Um, elliptical orbit. So if you're saying, I, I'm not disagreeing. Yes, Hubble is losing altitude. But if that's the case and there's nothing to pro propel it back up to its original operating altitude of 340 miles, over a 20-year period, Hubble should be, this year, within 10 to 20 miles of the ISS. Well, visual line of sight, no no optical are, are assessment or adjustment. I'm sorry? Are you familiar with orbital mechanics? Yes, sir, I am. Are you familiar with atmospheric drag? Yes, sir, I am. I know that Hubble, I know the, the ISS. Cycle? I'm sorry, sir? Are you familiar with the solar cycle? Yes, sir, I am. And its effect on, on the atmosphere? Yes, sir, I am. I, that's, I've been doing okay. nothing but studying that for three years. Okay, so obviously, you know, during solar minimums, the atmosphere contracts and there is very, very little drag at, at Hubble's altitude. So your two miles per year is, is a very gross um, oversimplification. No, I didn't say two miles per year. ISS is 100, yard long, 100 yard, yards long, 50 yards wide, give or take. Okay, it's three okay. times, it's three to five times the size of Hubble. Okay, so you have mm -hmm. a larger mass, you know, traveling at somewhat maybe, you know, a comparable speed. It's at lower altitude. So, yes, you're going to have more drag. Hubble's at 100 miles, supposed to be 100 miles above that. So, yes, you're going to have less atmosphere, but a little bit more, you know, uh, you're still going to have the atmosphere drag because neither vehicle is, is in free space. A vacuum. Right. Neither vehicle. And, and also, the, the Hubble orbit was raised during the servicing on um, two of the servicing missions. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You're, you're right. You're right. I agree with you on that because I looked at the servicing missions, and it seems as though Hubble, each servicing mission, Hubble dropped down based on its its its, its 15 orbits a day. It's if it's if it's behaving the same way the ISS is losing about a hundred a mile and a half to two miles every five minutes in an elliptical fashion, if Hubble's doing the same thing, that means that the STS servicing missions were able to get within a specific distance of it at a specific time to capture it, and then once they service it, they basically jettison it back up to where it should have been, which is around 330, 340 miles. 
But then after after 2008, the last servicing mission, we're looking at eight years. So again, you factor in from 2008 to now, within this year, Hubble's going to be within 15, 10 to 20 miles of ISS. That's the mathematics that you and I've learned. Give or take. I'm not, I don't have a supercomputer, so I can't do the exact numbers, but the rough calculations tell me that Hubble could be within visual eyesight view without a telescope, without binoculars, you'd be able to have literally line of sight. Well, I, I do not know what the ISS current altitude is. Right now, the ISS is at, according to this data, it says the ISS is at 251 Point seven seven miles, seven six. It's dropping right now, and its okay. velocity is seventeen thousand one hundred sixty six miles. Longitude one fifty three point eight eight three, actually one fifty four. Latitude is thirty nine point five one seven. That's where ISS is right now. Of course, they don't okay. have any. There's no similar database online to do the same thing for Hubble, um, and that's understandable. But um, oh, there, but there is. Is, is there a website for, same as ISS? Well, I don't know what you're using for ISS. It's well, I'm using, on. I'm using uh, ISS Tracker. Well, so, there's plenty of satellite tracking apps that, you know, have a large database. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah, yeah, I, I have about, you know, 20 of them in my, my repertoire that I can check. Well, there, there's certainly similar ones for, for Hubble, I and mean, you can get Hubble's real time position. Yeah, and, and again, I, I don't want to waste a lot of your time, Mike. You know, it, it just, it, it concerned me. I'm going to be honest with you. It really concerned me that HST was not in an international database, but the servicing missions are. Trying to get an understanding. And Hubble is continuing to baffle me. Right now, they're showing the Hubble at uh, the latitude is 20 uh, what's the elevation the altitude is 542 kilometers yeah okay sounds about right so you know but it's a software database and i can tell you here right now as a coder and gpu programmer and developer i could create the same thing in a week to mirror this and it wouldn't need to be real it literally show a picture of me in a little superman cape saying hey this is where i am and i got my hands up i'm i've i've got a little tether on the hubble and i'm following it and look at me you know and people would mm -hmm. pick, but but here's the thing if i showed you that and put it together in a week you'd be like oh that's not real you know but i want you to understand as you know an up-and-coming research scientist the average person, you know, they look at this and they're like, oh, well, there, there goes the Hubble at 542 kilometers. Mm -hmm. But you show them something they don't know. They don't they don't have a, an, a even a basic or foundation understanding of how software development, programming and computer graphic generated images and how you can actually program something to be in the sky. That's really not there. All right. Yeah. So. Hollywood does that all the time. No, no, I know, I know. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've actually taken advantage of you guys' uh, software vault, where I can go online and download a lot of the software applications that's available for the technology transfer program. So, you know, it's just one of those things to where I, 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 I would like to know if it's possible of anyone I can speak to who's responsible for submitting the information to FAI to see if maybe there was just an oversight or if it's a mistake. Or, and I hate to say this, that maybe you've been sitting there for 25 years and there's what you think is up there is really not there. And it's actually the photos are being taken by Sophia, which is at 45,000 well, feet on a 747. Sophia hasn't been flying nearly as long. Well, the program, the stratospheric observatory program has been in existence longer than, than Hubble. But they haven't had anything flying. For that long, I 
Latvia when Sophia is first. No, 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 yeah, uh, Sophia is not, not that old. It's been in existence, I think, since, what, 2002 or something, or 2000, what was it, 2004? I think 2002 or 2004. But there were airborne telescope observatories being flown longer than Hubble. They were just, they even, you got, your own website shows the actual history of the Stratospheric Observatory program. And it actually began with balloons because there's a satellite identical to Hubble, about two thirds the size that was launched from Antarctica on a balloon. There's a photo of that on on uh, the U.S. Antarctic website. They yeah. launch they launched yeah. it from McMurdo. Well, fine, but you know, the Hubble was taking um, yeah at, at wavelengths that. Yeah. Sophia, nor the balloons can, um, no, no, no. Achieve. Sophia can take. So. Sophia can take photos and wavelength. Sophia can do the same I thing mean. as Hubble. Yeah. Sophia can do. The, matter of fact, the telescope on Sophia is identical to Hubble. Everything that Hubble can do, Sophia can do. Well, I, I, I mean, of course, the plane's got to land, but when it's in the air. It can literally conduct the same technical imagery capture and analysis data that Hubble can do. And of course, Hubble's 24 7, Sophia's not. But when it's in the air, when Sophia's been in the air, it, it, it literally has captured the same photos as Hubble, and that's how I was able to do the comparison. As a matter of fact, okay. some of the pictures that Sophia captured were actually at a higher resolution and more clear than Hubble. Which, which also, you know, you know, surprised me a little bit. How could something inside the stratosphere take a photo and do imagery through three or four different more layers of atmosphere when Hubble is literally supposed to be out in the exosphere where there's very little to no atmosphere and it's, it's capturing more light than, than uh, Sophia is. I really hope I'm wrong. I really do. I hope I'm wrong about Hubble, because I I wouldn't want to be sitting next to you one day, and you'd be really, really, really angry to find out <laughs> that that Hubble may not be there. <laughs> well, it, it'd be quite a, um, I know it would be shocking, but it would be yeah. It would be shocking, but it just. I've already contacted FAI and I spoke to them and they said it's not in their database and they, they checked. It took them about a week to get back to me and they looked through the entire database and said it, they even looked to see if maybe it would have been erased or deleted by mistake, you know, because they were able to check their log records and there was never even anything submitted. Hmm. There was nothing. I mean, why put the servicing missions in the record? I mean, you can go to FAI.org when we hang up. Just check the servicing missions for yourself. You'll see them there. But when you when you check for Hubble, STS-31, you, you're entering Charlie Bolton's name, all the crew members, nothing. Nothing. And FAI has been in existence longer than NASA. I think, I'm not going to say that I'd be applying for any kind of Nobel Science Prize, but I think I might have a more viable theory of how it may all be working. Hmm. Interesting. I'm because, because dark well, fluid... I gotta go. Yes, sir. I, gotta get I really appreciate it, Mike. More. I really appreciate it Sorry. very much. Um, I didn't think I'd be able to talk to anyone at all because I tried to call the project manager. And when you click on uh -huh. Pound to go to his number and I click to the deputy project manager, Mr. Haskins, Haskins and... Um, the deputy project manager, project manager Pat Kraus, when I go to click on for their extensions, it just hangs up. Are they even working there anymore? Um, yeah, they're still here. So, so where, what, what side are you looking at to, to get the numbers? No, I didn't get the numbers. It just, I, I, I was given a number by the Goddard Center, and they told me to dial 2000, and it asked you to put in the prompts, press 3 for the uh, oh. directory. So I don't have your direct number. It just it says your extension. It says press this button to speak to this person. 
So uh, okay. when you yeah, press the sure. button, it doesn't go to them at all. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I can explain that. Yeah. Okie dokie. So okay. I really appreciate it, sir. I really do appreciate it. You no have problem. a good Memorial Day weekend and uh stay safe. You Take care, sir. Bye. Bye bye. Well there you have it, people. You heard the conversation. You heard it. You heard it clear as day. This guy could not answer why the Hubble is not in the FAI.org database. They all said the same thing. NASA's Office of in, in Office of Inspector General. Their special agent investigator says that's not a NASA website. We don't manage it. We don't operate it. We're not responsible for it. But they put all their other fucking missions in this database, but they didn't put Hubble. They put the servicing missions in the database, but they didn't put Hubble. This guy can't explain it at all. Never seen it. 25 years. 25 years. And now he's thinking, Man, I just talked to this guy. That Hubble is not where it is. He says it has no jets, propulsion, no nothing. It loses altitude, people. It's been losing altitude since 2008. That's NASA for you, people. You know my motto. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. And that, people, was the phone call of the year. All you have to do is lie on your back on a moonless night and look around carefully. Yeah, occasionally you'll see something that looks kind of like a star, but it's moving. It's moving a little fast too, and that's actually a satellite. Yeah. People claim to see satellites with the naked eye, even though they are only the size of a small bus or smaller and supposedly orbit hundreds or thousands of miles up. In reality, we all struggle to see a commercial plane relatively close to us at, you know, five to seven miles high due to the laws of perspective. We simply cannot see something that small from that far away. Now let's have a look at some low Earth orbiting objects such as the International Space Station or ISS for short. NASA says that the ISS orbits at only 250 miles high, but that is only 1 32nd of the Earth's diameter higher than the Earth itself. And imagine an ant on a basketball. You know, raise that ant uh, half an inch off the ground. And uh, now look at that ball with the ant from the opposite side of that ant and see if you can see the ant, which you can't. Then the sun can't shine its light onto the ISS during the nighttime. The Earth itself would block out that portion of the sun's light from reaching the ISS. So how can we see a reflection of sunlight off of the ISS at night? can't be done any other way at this point. And that's how it's kind of gone since.